A Boeing 737 careens out of control just four minutes after takeoff. The captain desperately fights with the controls as he tries to understand what has gone wrong. 56 terrified passengers hang on for dear life as their plane plunges towards the ocean below. How did the plane even get into this dire situation in the first place? And will the pilots be able to pull it out of its dive before it's too late? This is the horrifying story of Sriwijaya Air Flight 182. On the afternoon of January 9th, 2021, 56 passengers and 6 crew boarded a Boeing 737 operated by Sriwijaya Air at Jakarta in Indonesia. They were bound for Pontianak, also in Indonesia, a one and a half hour flight. The passengers had no idea as they boarded the plane that a perfect storm was brewing, of which the weather was only a small part. In fact, on this day, problems with the weather, the pilots, the airline, and with the aircraft itself, would come together with such malignant precision that the total length of the flight would be just four minutes. Up in the cockpit were two pilots. The captain was 54-year-old Afwan. He had a huge amount of experience, having built up almost 18,000 flying hours over the course of his career, 9,000 of which were on the 737. However, as we'll see, Experience alone is not a reliable indicator of proficiency. Sitting to his right was 34-year-old First Officer Diego Mamahit. He had 5,000 hours of flying experience, almost all of which, apart from his initial training, were on the 737. A few months previously, both pilots had received training for a particular type of emergency, which on this day, they would need to put to use. We'll look into that training in a few moments, and into why it was woefully inadequate, but it was far from the only deficiency on board this plane. As the pilots prepared their aircraft for departure, a quirk on this particular aircraft lay in wait for them. It had been plaguing this aircraft for years. In fact, it had raised its head on more than 60 occasions in the years leading up to this day. On none of those occasions had it caused a major issue. But in combination with the unique set of circumstances of this flight, it would spell disaster. As both pilots prepared the aircraft for departure, rainstorms pelted the aircraft and the surrounding area. This was not a pleasant day for flying, but it was far from out of the ordinary for a Jakarta January. At half past two that afternoon, Flight 182 pushed back from the gate and began taxiing to runway 25 right at Jakarta. So far, everything was routine. The captain would be flying the aircraft to Pontianak, while the first officer's job was to monitor the aircraft systems and to talk to air traffic control. The aircraft they were flying was a Boeing 737-500, one of the older generation 737s, now known as the 737 Classics. This particular aircraft rolled off the production line in 1994, and began service with Continental Airlines in the US before being sold to Sriwijaya Air in 2012. At 27 years old, it was nearing the end of its service life and had started to show signs of its age. In an airline with good maintenance procedures, this would be no problem. But this was not one of those airlines. In a few short minutes, lackluster maintenance practices would put the plane's 62 occupants in grave danger. At 2.36pm, the captain pushed the engines to take off thrust, and the plane began accelerating down the runway. All was normal as the captain lifted his plane into the air, and began climbing out to the west of the airport. As the plane climbed, the first officer contacted air traffic control, informing them that they were following their standard departure route. The controller cleared the crew to climb to 29,000 feet, this was good news for the pilots. The initial climb out is a busy phase of flight, and getting an unrestricted clearance to 29,000 feet would lighten their workload somewhat. As the plane passed through 1,800 feet, the captain turned on the autopilot and the autothrottle. The aircraft was now being flown completely by the autopilot. However, unlike the popular conception of the autopilot, it is not a smart machine. <laughs> 
It has various modes, with different levels of sophistication. Pilots move up and down these levels, depending on the needs of the flight at any given time. But all of these levels require programming by the pilots themselves. And, importantly, they all require that the pilots keep an eye on the flight path. In this way, the autopilot functions as a kind of third pilot, who has the most basic role of flying the plane. While it's doing this, one pilot, in this case the captain, should be monitoring the autopilot, while the other, in this case the first officer, should be monitoring the captain. The purpose of autopilots is not to eliminate pilots from the loop, but to place them in a supervisory role. We're about to see what happens when pilots take this supervisory role too lightly. As the plane entered the clouds, the pilots relied fully on their instruments to tell them their position in space. One key instrument, which would play a crucial role on this flight, was the EADI, or Electronic Attitude Direction Indicator. It tells the pilots the position of the plane relative to the horizon, that is, whether the nose is pointing up or down, or whether the plane is turning left or right. As the plane turned northeast along its departure route, the pilots noticed some rough weather on their weather radar. They engaged the heading select mode of the autopilot and turned the plane away from the storm. They also engaged the vertical speed mode of the autopilot, which allowed them to dial in a specific rate of climb in feet per minute which they wanted the autopilot to follow. And finally, they engaged the MCP speed mode of the autothrottle, which allowed them to select what airspeed the plane should be flying at. Now, something important happened. Something which had happened this very aircraft on dozens of occasions over the previous years. The pilots weren't telling the plane to climb particularly fast, or to accelerate all that much. And as a result of this, the autothrottle didn't need to demand as much power from the engines, so it began pulling the throttle levers back. However, the right-hand lever got stuck. It had been jamming on and off under similar circumstances for years. On about half of these occasions, the airline had dealt with this by having its engineers simply clean the electrical connectors in the autothrottle system. On other occasions, they had replaced suspected faulty components but neither of these solutions had fixed the problem. This had not caused any serious issues on previous flights, but this time, things would be different. As the plane reached its target airspeed, the autothrottle continued bringing the thrust levers back. But because the right lever was physically stuck, the right engine stayed at a high power setting. To compensate for this, the autothrottle began pulling the left engine throttle back even further. This condition, where one lever significantly deviates from the other, is known as a split throttle. This split continued to grow wider as the plane climbed. This might not seem like a major problem, and for the crews who had experienced this before, it hadn't been. All the pilots needed to do was to disconnect the autothrottle and pull the right engine lever back themselves. It would require some force, as the lever was stuck, but they would be able to do it. However, in order to do that, the pilots would first have to notice that there even was a problem. But as the autopilot was flying the plane, this was harder to do. The captain's hands weren't on the thrust levers, as they would have been if he'd been flying the aircraft manually. The autopilot was moving both the thrust levers and the control column. The captain's job was simply to make sure that the autopilot was doing what it was told. The captain saw another storm cell on his weather radar, and the pilots asked air traffic control if they could turn to a heading of 075 degrees to avoid it. The controller allowed this, and the pilots dialed in 075 on the autopilot. The plane continued its right-hand turn. All while this was happening, the left thrust lever was moving further and further back, while the right lever stayed stuck in the same place. Even without noticing the split thrust levers, there was another way the pilots could have noticed that the engines were not at the same power setting. In the centre of the cockpit were the engine instrument displays. The N1 display here tells the pilots how fast the fan blades at the front of the engine are spinning. If the pilots had been looking at these instruments, as they should have been while the autopilot was flying, they would have seen that there was a mismatch between the speed of the left engine and the right engine. Likewise, 
the fuel flow indicator here, showed different readings for each engine, as the right engine, being stuck on a higher setting, was using more fuel than the left. Over their many years of flying, however, the pilots had learned that their aircraft were pretty reliable. When they told the plane to do something, it did it. As a result, they weren't actively monitoring their instruments as the plane climbed. At this point, air traffic control told the crew to level off when they reached 11,000 feet, as there was another plane in the area above them. They put 11,000 feet into the autopilot, and all seemed normal. But still, as each second passed, the left engine lever moved further and further back. If it got far enough, the difference between the engine power on each side of the aircraft would be so great that the plane would begin to turn onto one side. There had been ample time for the pilots to notice the emerging thrust asymmetry, but now, as it reached its greatest extent yet, their situation began to deteriorate. The left engine was now almost at idle thrust, while the right engine had not budged from the initial position it had been set at just after takeoff. But there was a system which could come to their rescue. Installed in the aircraft in the late 1990s was a system called the Cruise Thrust Split Monitor. It kept track of the position of each thrust lever and disconnected the autothrottle if they got too far apart. When the autothrottle disconnects, a warning sounds, which sounds like this. This alerts the pilots that the autothrottle has disconnected, and the idea goes, when they grab hold of the throttles, they notice the discrepancy between the two levers. However, on flight 182, this didn't happen. The thrust levers were already at significantly different power settings, but the autothrottle stayed on. As it turned out, that system, the cruise thrust split monitor, requires a number of pieces of information in order to shut off in the event of split throttles. One of these is that the spoilers on one of the wings need to deflect a certain amount beyond their normal position. This is because such a deflection could only be the result of the aircraft trying to correct for the roll motion caused by the asymmetric thrust. In other words, when the two engines are at different thrust settings, they start to tip the aircraft over onto one side, and either the pilot or the autopilot will try to correct for this by turning the control column in the opposite direction, which raises the spoilers on one wing. This raising of the spoilers disconnects the autothrottle. This is what should have happened on this flight, as the spoilers on the right wing had gone well past the 2.5 degree deflection which is supposed to disconnect the autothrottle. But on this aircraft, a faulty spoiler position sensor, or a misrigged actuator, meant that the aircraft didn't register a spoiler deflection value which was high enough to disengage the autothrottle. Basically, the computer just didn't notice that the spoiler was raised as high as it was. The cruise thrust split monitor was simply receiving falsely low readings from the sensor, and, as a result, the autothrottle stayed connected, and continued reducing the power on the left engine. Because there was more thrust coming from the right-hand side of the plane than there was coming from the left, the plane slowly began to roll out of its right-hand turn. As the aircraft rolled further left, the autopilot tried desperately to keep it turning to the right, and was moving the control columns quite far to the right to achieve this. But it wasn't enough. The plane continued rolling to the left. The passengers had no idea that anything was amiss. In fact, the two pilots were just as oblivious. If they had been monitoring their engine instruments, they would have noticed the split throttles. And if they had been monitoring their attitude direction indicator, they would have seen that far from turning right onto a heading of 075, the plane was now established in a left-hand turn. And as the thrust lever continued moving back, this turn was getting steeper by the second. Air traffic control then told the pilots that they could now climb to 13,000 feet. The captain went to set this altitude on the autopilot, but just as he did, the aircraft rolled through 37 degrees of left bank, and the automated voice of the 737 warned the pilots. Bank angle, bank angle, bank angle. This startled the pilots. This was the first time they had noticed that anything was going wrong. The captain reacted immediately, but he made a critical mistake. He saw that the control column was turned to the right, 
and he knew that he had told the autopilot to turn right. So he assumed that the bank angle warning was in relation to an overly steep right-hand turn, when in fact, the opposite was true. Reacting to what he thought was a steep right turn, he grabbed the control column and banked the plane further to the left. This rolled the aircraft into an extremely steep left-hand turn. Within seconds, the plane was on its side, and it started to fall. The autothrottle disengaged, and the captain began wrestling with his aircraft as it entered a terrifying plunge. The pilots now found themselves in a life and death situation, where every second counted. Months previously, they had received training on how to recover from exactly this kind of situation. This is known as upset recovery training, and it had been mandatory in Indonesia since 2017. But for reasons we'll see in a moment, the training the pilots had received was woefully inadequate. And now, in a nosedive miles above the Java Sea, they found themselves completely out of their depth. The plane continued accelerating as it dove towards the ocean. The overspeed warning started to sound, telling the pilots that the plane was now travelling faster than it was designed to, and that it was in danger of being ripped apart by the force of the air. Everyone on board was being thrown about in their seats by the shifting g-forces as the plane twisted and turned towards the ocean. The first officer tried to bring the captain's mind to the training he had received, shouting, Captain, Captain, upset, upset but it was no good. The captain was still in shock from how quickly the situation had deteriorated. The one instrument which could save their lives was right in front of him, the electronic artificial direction indicator. By using it to determine the plane's position relative to the horizon, the captain would be able to level the plane's wings and bring it out of its terrifying dive. But he never did this. In fact, it was a full 10 seconds before the captain even noticed that the throttles were split. He correctly responded to this by pulling the right engine back to idle. But by this point, it was already too late. At 20 minutes to 3, just 4 minutes after takeoff, Flight 182 plunged into the Java Sea. All 62 people on board died instantly. A search and rescue operation was launched immediately after the accident, and within a few days, the cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder were found. As their contents began to paint a picture of the sequence of events that led to the crash, Indonesia's National Transportation Safety Committee began to issue safety recommendations aimed at preventing a reoccurrence of this type of accident. Among these was a recommendation to Indonesia's Director General of Civil Aviation to develop guidelines for airlines on the delivery of upset recovery training to pilots. Despite this training having been mandatory since 2017, Indonesian authorities had not described in detail what it should entail, nor had they set any national standards for it. This meant that airlines were free to design this training more or less as they wished, which led to pilots receiving substandard training. The NTSC also recommended that Sriwijaya Air handle repeated defects like those that occurred in the right-hand throttle lever in a more systematic way, so that serious problems like this do not remain unfixed for extended periods of time. Just 11 days after the crash, the airline issued a notice to its pilots, urging them to actively monitor the aircraft's position, attitude, and the thrust lever position at all times. The crash of Flight 182 highlights how many things have to go wrong at so many levels for planes to crash. But it also highlights how interconnected those different levels are, and therefore, how important it is that complacency does not take hold at any level. Not only do planes have to be well maintained, but aviation authorities have to provide clear and robust guidelines to airlines, airlines have to provide high quality training to their pilots, and pilots have to follow that training. Flight 182 crashed because on that particular day in January 2021, numerous failings came together in just the wrong way. With the adoption of the NTSC safety recommendations, we can hope that this kind of accident will never happen again. Special thanks to the Patreon and YouTube members for helping to make this video possible. If you'd like to see more of these videos, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. I've put the link here on screen. I'd especially like to thank Joey, Steve Wilcox, JB Funk and Simon Burbage for their very generous support. Green Dot Aviation now has a Discord server, so if you'd like to join a growing community of people discussing all things aviation, 
just tap the link in the video description and I'll see you there. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon for the next episode.